I want to welcome everyone uh, tonight to uh, take a look at the World War II home front in uh, okay. Springfield and Clark County. And uh, I wanted to give a little background to this uh, a, couple, a few years ago when it was the um, centennial celebration of uh, America's entry into World War I. We had done two different exhibits in 2017 and 2018 looking back at uh, Clark County and Springfield's role in the war. And we looked at a lot of the home front efforts then. And I remember uh, that was one of my favorite parts of working on that exhibit was going through the papers and pulling out a lot of what was going on. And what really struck me then looking back at World War I was how immediate the response was uh, to support on the home front. And it wasn't until I hadn't done a lot of newspaper research uh, in World War II, but that was that's the that was the era that I was more familiar with, having learned more about it in school and having grandparents. Um, my grandpa fought in uh, World War II on um, in the Philippines, so I had a little bit more experience there. But I hadn't got to do some of my own research. So, uh, what this presentation focuses on is what we have to show the home front efforts in Springfield and Clark County, based on what we have in the archives and in the newspapers. And in the newspapers is where you find everything uh, that, that you would ever want to know about all, all the different efforts that were happening. And um, just as it struck me going through to find out what, what everybody was doing to support during World War I, it was even more apparent during World War II, um, the outpouring of, of uh, parades and uh, drives and, and things like that. So I'm going to uh, I may have I may have tried to fit too much into slides. This one was a hard one to stop with because it was it's really fun to do newspaper research if you guys have done it before. And, and it, any of you that lived through this, you um, you may remember seeing a lot of these ads and, and things going on in the paper. So it's it's really interesting to go back through. Um, and I had to keep telling myself, OK, I think I've got enough. I should just stop. <laughs> but but there's there's a lot of stuff in here because I wanted to just kind of encompass the whole um, effort that was going on. So. Uh, this will be recorded and I tried to on each slide kind of give a general idea of what years or months we were looking at because um, you'll see a lot of uh, newspaper coverage here which we haven't used a lot of that but um, as far as our collection goes we we have quite a bit in the way of uh, physical items that you that you can see um, we don't have a lot on the home front I want this I'm starting with um, the case that we have on the first floor in the museum um, that is basically our home front case. And uh, this is where we talk about, um, you know, this is our, our um, National Row Gallery. And this is as you're coming around the bend, you get into the uh, World War II era. Uh, and we talk about that this is an era where we had come out of the Great Depression and um, that Springfield industry was beginning to revive after the Great Depression. And then we had Pearl Harbor in um, December 1941, and that's what uh, thrust us into uh, into the war. And immediately, uh, Springfield's uh, factories started to turn to um, transferring to do war production. So this case focuses some on that. We've got the um, Army Navy E award that uh, Robinson Myers uh, was awarded, which we'll, you'll see more about that in a later slide. And you see some of the other um, items that we have in our collection that represent those home front efforts, the civilian defense uh, materials, uh, nurses that were, were working uh, and uh, different things to do with, we have ration cards and things about victory gardens and uh, all sorts of stuff in that case. So if you wanna see it down in the museum, this is, this is where you can see some of that home front stuff. But like I said, a lot of the story you find through pictures, which we don't have nearly enough of, but newspaper coverage. That's that's where a lot of a lot of that story, if you want to see the the local story. So I wanna I wanna preface all of this by saying that this was going on all across the country, no matter what city you lived in, um, in the United States, everybody was supporting the war efforts in the same ways, um, through different different drives, which I will cover all of the different types of collection drives that were going on. Um, but you were seeing this all across the country. This was a universal. So I wanted to really focus on what was happening here. But you could, any any city could go through um, probably their old newspapers if they're still available and all of that and find this sort of coverage. So uh, this is a kind of a universal story. Um, this was the big, the big um, 
just like today, we're all in this together that you see in um, in World War One and World War Two, and you're seeing now um, that that people are having a universal experience. So we're looking at how I'm going to show you some specifically um, what was going on here. So the biggest thing that most people think about is war bond drives. Um, buy buy bonds. That was something that was big in World War One as well. Um, buying bonds to support the war. Uh, which was something as I was growing up, I knew that you could still get bonds and I would get them for my birthday, like, you know, savings bonds, but I didn't really, so I never quite understood the, the point of um, the bonds. So I have uh, found a couple of good uh, things in the paper, which the paper is full of bonds, uh, buy bonds, everybody is telling you to buy bonds. So as you go through the papers in 1941, 42, 43, every single ad that you see for any company in town always either has big bold on the ad buy bonds or something down you know always a reminder to buy bonds or where you can buy bonds um but this talks about how those um bonds mature and accrue interest uh, a little bit of information on that but then you'll see um one of these ads was in you know around valentine's day saying buy your bonds first then get that diamond <laughs> so you see a lot of things like that or a lot of people saying you know don't, don't worry about us Put, save your money and buy bonds. Um, so we're, we're really um, being patriotic and giving over um, their support there. Um, I love this one here. Um, have the, the little baby from, from the hub um, saying, uh, I gave my daddy, won't you lend your money? Uh, so a lot of uh, tugging at the heartstrings there. Um, and the, a lot of the bond drives were, were led by people in the community. And this is an instance of um, school pupils were helping um, lead this bond. This one is from um, towards the end of the war, April 1945. Um, I meant to look up exactly how many war bond drives there were, but I know that the seventh one was after the war, um, to right, right towards the end of the war. So this is this is heading towards that seventh bond uh, drive, and you see uh, a student here uh, that's that's helping lead that eight eight year old Michael Scanlon from um, Cecil Street is. Uh, goes to St. Raphael School. Uh, so you'll see, you see a lot of the uh, you know, local people. This was one where theaters were specifically were leading a drive uh, and they, they had a lot of, um, they had coupons that um, put this coupon, present it to the doorman, buy a bond and then see the show as our guest. So that was, you know, you were, you were buying a bond but then you get to see the, the, the film for free. So this was at any one of the Checkers theaters, which they had, um, several theaters at this yeah. time. And then this one over here, we see uh, Gus Sun. Um, I meant to look up again when he died. I think he died in the 1940s. So this would be towards the end of his life. But you see um, him here um, that the helping kick mm -hmm. off that theater drive that they had. Mm -hmm. uh, and then along with that entertainment thing, we had, there was lots stars that that helped to uh support those bond drives around the country um i unfortunately I, I i find this coverage saying that um alana massey fred astaire and hugh hubert um came to springfield but i never got to see pictures of them actually here we're not in the paper but we see that um they came in 1942 so you see fred astaire there in the middle um they came and they spoke at the masonic temple at the luncheon that was um to support one of those bond drives and then we had of our bondadiers which the people that would, would sell the bonds. Um, this picture here is actually was taken in Urbana and it shows some bondadiers with um, some privates uh, up there that were helping um, with, a, with a drive up, up in that area. And this is the, in the local paper, they had a full page ad telling you who all the bondadiers were. So if you read through this, um, you'd see a lot, of, a lot of names you might recognize. Um, like, for example, I was looking through and I saw like Constantine Link and um, a lot of people that own all, all the businesses in town or um, different entrepreneurs were all on this list here were people that you could buy your bonds from. So they were helping to support the effort, lending their local celebrity names to, to that effort. And then this was the um, after uh, BE Day in May, you see a big push for the Seventh War loan. Um, to finish things up. So you'll see uh, a lot in there that, you know, we, we still have, we still have more to go um, and all the, the different retailers. So 
throughout all of, you know, every single month, every year of the war, you see bond reminders through every single ad um, everywhere you go. And then they're always reminding you, okay, coming up, the next bond drive is starting. So you'll see lots of coverage of the different people that were helping to support that. Um, and one of the ways that you could get uh, support, you could turn your bonds into bullets uh, was you could recycle beer bottles or any any bottles uh, or was one thing that um, they had time that you could recycle those and, and then they were encouraging you to turn that money around to, uh, to buy bonds with that. Um, and this was an example of uh, something that you were getting money back to then buy the bonds, but you'll see um, coming up in the next few slides, all of the different dr uh, drives that they had to help support directly the war effort. Nine North Center. We've got um, the Red Cross needed support um, to, to offer humanitarian support and uh, overseas. So there was just Red Cross fund drive. So this is um, showing a parade in March, 1943 on, um, and you can see this is on um, the War Fund headquarters, um, I think on Fountain. Um, you can see the Red Cross War Fund um, set up here. I think this looks like, well, that, that building is gone now, but yeah, this is down on Fountain um, next to where, uh, around where Sipendipity is today. Um, and you can see here uh, pictures of the people that were leading the 1945 Red Cross War Fund Drive. Um, and they had them every year, every few months, there was a different drive. Um, and you can see they, they list out all the people. So this is a great thing to go through and find out, you know, if you had family that was involved in this to see who was helping lead those efforts in town. Some of you may, uh, may have, you know, parents or grandparents that you remember being a part of this. Uh, they had blood drives, which is what I think of immediately when I think of some sort of drive or something. Um, so uh, blood drives were obviously necessary. Um, this is showing them at 1943. Uh, the Red Cross was running those. Um, this was one that they, they were set up at uh, City Hospital. And then this is a whole uh, group of people that were donating. And I love uh, through all of it, everybody's identified, including where everybody lived, which they don't do that anymore in the papers, tell you everybody's address. But uh, these are really interesting to go through and pick out a lot of names that you would recognize. And I'll, these slides will be up later too for people. Um, and I'll share these slides directly because there's a lot of detail in here that we don't normally see in the slides that I share because we don't share so much newspaper stuff. So I do want people to have a chance to be able to clip through these and kind of um, look at them closer. So these will be available later along with the recordings because um, I want everybody to, to really have a chance to examine them more closely if they want to. And come look at the newspapers yep. themselves if they want. Um, those are always available. Um, tin can drives was another thing. Um, we talk more about scrap drives later, but this was specifically just for tin cans. And this shows you what uh, a properly um, uh, properly saved tin can can, can turn into. Um, so they have tin, tin can collections at the different schools. And um, throughout the paper, they'll tell you the different places you can bring stuff. You can see a, a shipment of 40 tons of cans that um, in here. And they had all, a full seven weeks in um, 1943 of the drives. Clothing drives uh, was, was another thing. Um, so I imagine, uh, or the, was the clothing just being turned around and, re, and reused? Does anybody know about that? Or if they could just remake it in other things or if they could break it down for that? That's the one I meant because that was one that had, I had not known about um, clothing drives. being. I would, I would imagine it would, it, it was being probably broken down, at least some of it was being broken down, the cotton possibly used for bandages or um, uh, mm -hmm. not necessarily reused as is for the most part. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I was saying I hadn't, I hadn't seen too much about, about clothing drives, but this was one that caught my eye going through the paper. Um, there was book drives, so I imagine that's in, in, again related to, to the paper drives, but this is the one, we have this one on the second floor in our rotating gallery, and I love this picture. Um, like seeing it all the time, it's in front of uh, Blair Hall on uh, Wittenberg campus, and this is um, uh, a group of students that were doing a were doing a book drive, and then during the war, 
uh, Blair Hall was used as a um, uh, place for the Army Air Force Training School. Um, and there was uh, several buildings that uh, were given up on campus uh, as part of that uh, training program. And I've got a couple more slides later that, sh that show some of that. Uh, and this, I remember this picture had um, uh, Barbara Barth in it, I think. She may have been this one here. She just telling us that she was in that picture. Uh, so I believe that's her in the middle. And I, because I, I, I seem to remember her telling me that she was angry that she had had to wear pants that she wanted to wear. Uh, so I, I think that's her in the middle there. Uh, paper drives. Uh, I, I like this. Uh, lots of political cartoons throughout there. I didn't. I didn't throw some of those in because uh, a lot of them I didn't really get. <laughs> I have to go back and look up some of the details. Just as political cartoons today, once you're past some of the details, you don't get all of them. But there's a lot of great stuff there. But um, they're showing you know that if you're thinking about things that you can give for the war effort, you should be working on it now, going through to see what you have and how you can help. Um, so they had uh, paper drives and every year. Um, of the war as well. And um, a lot of the schools were leading those drives. And we've got a picture here of um, kindergartners at Kenwood Heights um, had won that, that uh, paper drive um, in 1943 when they, when they had that. Um, and they'd always you know, tell people what, what days to put stuff out. And um, this one was being led by Oscar T. Hawk, who was uh, superintendent um, of the, the schools at, at one point. Uh, and then we've got more about what the, the, you know, not a lot of people know what, what paper, uh, how the paper can help. So a little bit, a little graphic here to explain to people how important it is to save their waste paper. And then scrap drives, which is another thing that more people are more familiar with. Um, there was a picture that I couldn't find that I um, shared with the newspaper a while back that showed um, a scrap drive out on the, um, the lawn across the street from uh, what would have been our building um, area um, back then, but this is one showing um, boilers being taken down for scrap. This one says, here men get rid of dishonest scales <laughs> for scrap metal. <laughs> so turning them into, uh, for, for uh, what, how did they word it? Um, for a more honorable part of American life. Uh, so this was um, frequently happening, this one, 1942 and 44. And this is a great picture we have of, of young boys um, helping lead a scrap drive. I've seen um, a couple other people share um, pictures like this online. Um, I know Dick Hatfield had shared one that I think uh, had, it, had him in it. So I, I, we, we don't have that one in our collection, but we have a similar one. And this one here shows that um, one of the um, howitzers was given that had stood in front of the George Coltis post. They gave it to be able to be melted down and used. And I couldn't find that article again. That was something that I'd run across uh, a few years ago doing newspaper research talking about um, that across the country, a lot of old cannons um, from various conflicts and, and things were melted down, which is something um, I talked to uh, a researcher uh, that was here a couple of months ago to research the cannon that we have in our collection that was from the Civil War, but it's actually a 1812 era cannon. And he said, it's so rare um, for a cannon to have survived, especially from that era. But during World War II, that's something that you saw across the country was that a lot of um, cannon that were used uh, were, were melted down. And, and another article I couldn't find again, but that I'd run across was talking about um, across the country, a lot of statues were melted down. And, I, and people have always asked about what happened to that statue that used to stand in front of um, Warder Public Library. It was, I can't remember who it is, but um, I don't know if he's on here. I had talked to Barbara, um, Barbara Matthews. I talked to your brother about the statue. Um, and I, I think what happened to that statue was that it was given um, and melted down um, during World War II, but I have to go back again and try and find that article. Uh, and then this is just showing people, other people in the community that were aiding in those efforts, um, the Girl Scouts and the Boy Scouts. Um, we actually have, uh, this picture here is from the, uh, the yearbook. Uh, the 1944 Springfield High School yearbook was called The Four Freedoms. And uh, throughout the yearbook, they had people 
uh, posing to um, demonstrate the, I believe, painting by Norman Rock or paintings by Norman Rockwara series. Um, and this was one of those uh, photos in there showing um, Scouts, um, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts helping to support the, the bond drive efforts. And, and then this one here, we had Girl Scouts going door to door to uh, encourage people, explain how to share the meat. So this was, um, we haven't even gotten to the rationing slides yet. Um, and to save the tin to help people uh, uh, figure out how, how they could help the war effort. And then over here, we've got Boy Scouts that were doing a uh, war stamp uh, bond uh, or a campaign to, for, for bonds. This was uh, an interesting one. The, the the government needed lots of typewriters, so there was there was various calls that you see throughout the paper saying, you know, we need we need scrap, we need metal, and then there was a call for um, 150,000 typewriters to be sent to. Um, I know that that's what my grandfather did um, when he when he enlisted. He told them that he could type. And that was something that they were very happy to have. So I know that he, he was able to help type, um, you know, reports and, and things that, that were very necessary. Um, so there, this is, there was a lot of um, things that you saw in the paper in 1942 and 43 of companies that were donating their typewriters. Um, and then in this case, we have Springfield High School donated 16 typewriters to the government. Um, you see, you see um, Mr. Fox here, Charlie Fox, uh, handing those over. Uh, and this here is, uh, Steel Products Engineering Spico is um, giving typewriters over. So um, we saw a lot of a lot of coverage of that of different places that, that were giving and how many they were giving. Uh, so another thing that there's a, a, a lot on this, and this is what another thing that most people think about when they think about war, they know about rationing and ration cards. And some of you on here may have had ration cards. I know um, the whole size are, are on here. De Bob has definitely <coughs> given his family's ration cards. Um, we have quite a few in the collection. Um, Mostly those are in family collections. They come in with family stuff because um, everybody in the family got one. Uh, and this is an article here. Um, and these are from 1943 showing that um, people were, had to you know, fill out their registration and then there was a ration board um, that would, uh, I'm not entirely sure how the ration board worked. <laughs> I need to look up. I think there's a later slide out here that talks about what the, uh, the role of the ration board. Um, but this is here, this was before they had started any sort of alcohol rationing in 1943, but um, this is explaining, you know, why alcohol was, was an important um, for the war effort um, for, for medical purposes and, and that a lot of it was being turned over for that. So this is, this is talking about that it's necessary to add that to the things that are rationed. Uh, so here you see an application. This is for ration book free. So I think that they lasted, and um, if you're, and anyone on here can can correct this for me, um, your books lasted for a certain amount of time. So you would you would have to get a, a new book later. There it didn't um, didn't like last through, through the entire time. So um, I think there was different uh, starting periods for these. So this would be for for book number three. Uh, I don't know if I have. I have the years on this one here, 1943. Um, somebody on here, uh, Barbara said she remembers ration tokens, um, blue and red. Um, I think at this time, I, I, I'm not sure that wasn't in this era, was it, Barbara? I think they were, they were the stamps is all that we've come across, but, um, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but this shows um, they would frequently publish in the, the newspaper, the rationing cap, the calendars. So there were certain dates that something would go um, start to be rationed um, so people could stock up right ahead if they knew that, you know, the rationing for sugar was starting on this date. Or um, like here, this is 1943, that liquor rationing in Ohio began on June 1st. Um, here we're, we're in May. Um, so they would have deadlines for using certain coupons. So I've got another slide here that shows your, um, your coupons that are numbered. You can see these are, you know, one through this was a whole stamp. I think it went through like 50, one through 50. I only showed half the, um, the stamps here, but um, if you go back to the calendar, you know, you, you had deadlines that you had to use certain uh, stamp numbers by. Uh, and, and the different colored coupons and, and all of that. So they tried to make that very clear to everybody in the paper to, to keep up with that. 
Um, it seemed to me like a kind of very complicated system. Um, this is a book that we have uh, in the collection from uh, Virginia Dorothy and um, the, the stamps here on this side. And um, this is showing uh, what your uh, ration, uh, point rationing, so they had a point system, um, what, what you could get with, uh, uh, with certain, uh, as part of the rationing. This is in January, 1943. And then uh, another thing that you see in, throughout the paper is all of the different food companies and, and grocery ads um, explaining, you know, get the most out of your, your uh, rationing points or get the most out of your stamps uh, with their food. So when you see um, meat rationing is, is um, ramping up, you'll see companies say, you know, you'll get the most, um, your, the most with our, um, our markets. So you'll see like Kroger and this is a uh, white villa cans um, and different things that you'll see. Um, just a bit throughout the thing is, is uh, um, how to how to better use their rations. You could uh, could save was by by going meatless. Um, so you'll see uh, a lot of uh, recipes for for meatless uh, going going meatless. Uh, Heinz obviously they had had quite a few um, for the spaghetti and eggplant and uh, macaroni and cheese casserole. Uh, and then you could st always stretch your meat more with, with oats. Uh, and then another uh, way that people were, were doing their part was by planting their own victory, victory gardens. Um, and this is something that you're seeing a lot of now. I know I've got friends that are have been gardening a lot the last year. Uh, my sister planted a big garden um, to, uh, and that even now, you know, they're still talking about, well, there'll be shortage of canned goods, you know, what, what can we do? Um, but on, there's a lot of coverage throughout the paper showing different gardens around town and how to plan your garden. And they would have uh, workshops telling this is here, um, uh, showing that he's doing uh, frames for in the garden, but they would have uh, layouts for people showing how to how to plant things that you can you can still find um, and you can get online today if you're wanting to start a garden but you know they they have that now throughout the paper and they would have different um, things advertised where you could go learn more about um, how to plant and what to plant and when to plant uh, and, and then you could get supplies everywhere so this is one of those features where they're featuring gardens throughout town and I saw somebody mention on our on our Facebook page that they remember that there was a, a victory garden that was at the back of Ferncliff. Um, so I'd like to look up more about that to see if I can find any information about that or if anybody um, remembers hearing about that. But this is, you see, uh, Sears is, is advertising that you can get your Victory Garden fashions and um, you can get your supplies at, um, at Sears as well for all the different things that you'll need for the garden, your seeds and everything. Um, and saying, you know, this is how you can pad your, your rations is by, by growing yourself. So um, the next slide, we've got a little bit more about canning, would help you to stretch your, uh, what you had grown. So uh, they would give away free books about uh, food preservation and canning to help uh, with that. And then in our collection, we have uh, canning supplies that are, that are I believe, from, from that era. Um, I just showed a couple of things. This is the, you know, to fill the, fill the jar. I just imagine, I, I've never canned, <laughs> so I've eaten canned stuff, but uh, this is, I look a sieve for looks like uh, you'd be mashing fruit pulp into it maybe to get juice out of it or something like that something to get matter out of a liquid if you're making jelly maybe i don't i don't know anybody out there can <laughs> well um barbara has commented in the chat that her uh dad had a victory garden on west home road um just before st paris pike uh, around the corner from alice bauman's house uh, so uh, we've got, and then with canning, um, I had looked up more about canning, you know, you, you need, you need more sugar for canning. So if you were going to be doing canning, they have this application here, um, where you could, you were allotted some extra sugar, 
Um, this is the one that we had, uh, I had sent to the paper this week uh, to talk about that. But um, this, this picture is from 1942, um, showing women in line for their sugar ration. And if they were canning, they would be allowed to get a little bit more. Uh, another thing that we see both in, uh, you saw, saw this in World War I too, was coal rationing. Uh, and, and there was a coal strike at this time in uh, 1943. And uh, so this here is talking about that FDR had, had seized the mines. And then this is, uh, he was going to go with a coal uh, reply, basically telling them that they needed to, uh, they needed to get back to work because they needed the coal to win the war. Um, but this is here showing um, companies saying, you know, we can help you um, be better insulated and, and, and uh, help with your fuel bill, fuel bill because coal rationing is going to be starting. So um, that's how a lot of um, companies were, were getting um, behind the effort to help people make things last longer and, and work better. And you, you see more of that here, too. Like this is from the Ohio Edison Company talking about um, you know, you're not going to be able to get a new refrigerator right now, but we can help you make your refrigerator run better. Um, just made me think of the, the joke is your refrigerator running. <laughs> this is, uh, you know, this was their way of, of helping make sure that everything that was, was running smoothly. So I imagine that um, uh, appliance repair, repair places probably saw better business now. And I had seen also some um, things about that, um, since new products weren't available, there was a big rise in auctions where people could um, could purchase newer goods from, you know, used goods from people, but they wouldn't be able to go to the store to buy that new couch or, or things like that. So I, I had run across one that showed that there was a, a big frenzy at the auction of people trying to buy new to them things um, because they wouldn't be able to get them in the store. And I love this one here, um, the Sunoco station, um, talking about how, you know, that ration driving because they, they were rationing uh, rubber, so you couldn't get new tires. You really couldn't drive that much. Um, I remember uh, Flossie was telling me the other day about um, uh, that her her dad would make rubber bands using, um, I think she said old old bike tires or you know old old uh, old inner tubes uh, because you couldn't get rubber bands because um, rubber was being rationed. But I love this ad here showing, you know, how to how to keep your car up so that, you know, it would last longer because um, obviously you couldn't buy a new car right now. You couldn't get the tires for it. Um, but also made me think was um, copyright infringement not a thing? <laughs> because those guys look suspiciously like Mickey Mouse to me. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, there's a, so, maybe do, it, do we know if Sunoco had a deal with like, Disney? <laughs> I, I don't know. And that was something that I wanted to look up because this was the only time I saw anything like that. I remember, I know that's looking uh, awful lot. During World War II, a lot of the like nose art and, and things on planes, they would use um, characters because I'd seen that at the Air Force Museum. But I was really surprised to run across this and thought, well, maybe they yeah. didn't have a deal or maybe it just didn't matter because, you know, every, every, the ads every day are hand drawn by people working for the companies, you know, the, the, the department stores, the grocery stores, and, you know, they had um, ad departments that were, you know, drawing these out. Uh, so I was amused to, to see to see this in there. But again, you know, a reminder to take better care of the things you have now because you can't get them new. Uh, another thing that was rationed was, was telephone calls. You see a lot of ads from Ohio Bell uh, talking about, um, limiting your long distance calls between certain hours or um, if it's not important, you know, don't make that call because you might be tying up lines that uh, may be getting important news to the front or, or, or things like that. And I like this one down here talked about um, that cradle telephones have gone to war. So you might be getting an older telephone and this is why and don't complain about it because, you know, they need those phones. Um, so we're, we're helping to support that system over there. Uh, for the war effort. And then you see a lot of these like around the holidays reminding people, you know, we've got men on the front that might be trying to get to their family, you, you know, li please limit your calls, let them let them go first. Um, so that they were able to communicate with their families. Uh, women in the workforce, another another big thing, Rosie the Riveter um, is, is, is the one of the um, Long-standing things that people um, 
think of when they think of World War II and, and those war efforts is women in the workforce and going to work in the factories um, when the men were fighting. Um, so we, we see a lot of um, features showing um, different companies where women are working um, as saying, you know, what can I be doing? Uh, this is, this is, there's some in 1942 when things are just really starting to ramp up that they're, they're needing more women in the efforts saying, you know, uh, what can you do? Think about what you can do, trying to talk uh, women into joining the workforce. Um, and then you see these towards the end of the war. Um, this is December 1944. This whole uh, full page ad uh, or feature that they had was um, women prefer their homes to war work, um, assuring that, um, yes, we're happy to do this now, but we're happy to go home when, when, when this is over. Uh, so they have, uh, they had a whole feature of um, interviewing women in the, in the factory, the different plants. And this had uh, how to become Nellie the Riveter, uh, which I, that was another thing that I had wanted to look up was, was when Rosie the Riveter, if that was the popular um, name during that time or um, just in, in general, but um, this is uh, 1943, uh, Nellie the Riveter and we've got, um, uh, them working in the National Youth Administration shops, uh, training uh, to do lathe work. And then this year on WHIO, they had a regular uh, feature um, on the job with the fair sex where you could hear from women in the industry. They could tell you what it was like. And this was a, a push to, um, to get um, their viewpoint on the job and, and, and to see if you wanted to, to get into that. Uh, this is the other things that you see um, is different ads from companies explaining that um, we are being affected by the change in workforce. So this was um, a lot from Perfection Laundry that I ran across saying that, um, sorry, we couldn't get to your laundry. We, we have are having a manpower shortage just like everybody else and are not able to get it. Um, this was here, you know, saying we can't take anymore. Uh, but this year uh, from 1945, um, showing that they were uh, prioritizing uh, servicemen's uh, if they were home and needed, and they, they would do rush jobs on their uniforms to make sure that they were covered and could, could get back and get what they needed. And then this was just a general um, full page uh, feature of all of the different women um, in Clark County that were, were part of the war effort. They were leading um, with the Victory Garden uh, programs with American Women's Volunteer Service um, with the Red Cross. They were part of the civilian defense. So this is just showing a um, group of local women that were all uh, part of that here. And then with all those of the factories converting to war work, I'd mentioned this back on that first slide. Um, we have the Army Navy uh. e flag shown here um, that was given to Robbins and Myers. But uh, there was quite a few companies that got the Army Navy E. Um, Oliver, uh, farm equipment here and we see them um, everybody had their big presentation at memorial hall so you're seeing uh, memorial hall stage here um, national supply also had that and we've got recordings from um, national supplies ceremony that were, were donated uh, to the collections and um, something that you saw every time another uh, every time a new company was announced that they were receiving a an e award or a security award, which we'll see on the next slide, um, there would be an entire special section dedicated to whatever company was receiving that award with congratulations from just about yeah. every company in town that you can um, think of. You'll see this, just, just one of those examples here, but you'll see full pages of, um, of congratulations. And then here's a picture that we have of the William Bailey Company, which was known for making windows. Um, and they continued with that after the war, but during the war, they, they turned over their production efforts as well. And the interesting thing that you know, which makes sense is that while all of the companies are being rewarded for their war efforts, it doesn't say at the time what they're doing, um, which, which is good, to, um, you know, that, that, that was for security reasons. Um, we know that Robbins and Myers, um, and then this may have been known during the war, but I could not, I did not see it mentioned anything that they were making um, but they made um parts for the bomb site for the northern bomb site that was you know helps make um 
it's more accurate, more accurate to, uh, for bombing. Um, the other award that a lot of companies received was the National Security Award. So you would see, again, the same thing in the paper um, when the uh, award would be given. Um, Phil Collier um, Publishing received that award. National Supply also got a uh, National Security along with their um, Army, Navy, E, and then Superior had, had gotten that as well. And this was uh, part of the uh, civilian defense program, which I, I've got on the next slide, but um, we have the Crow Collier newsletters um, for a number of years, including the war years. So that's really interesting um, throughout the newsletters. I didn't, I didn't add any of those to here, but we've been working on scanning those to share um, in the future, um, digital copies of all of the Crow Collier newsletters. But in, in there, they talk about um, what people in, in the factory and people at Crow Collier are doing to support the war efforts. Um, those are really interesting to look through. International Harvester employee newsletters during the war years are also very interesting, um, highlighting uh, employees that have gone to war and, and what people are doing at home. Uh, this is part of the civilian defense uh, collection that we have. And this was a, a showing members of the uh, Civilian Defense Council. We've got um, Principal um, Charlie Fox here again. Uh, from Springfield High putting on his gas mask. So people uh, could be parts of uh, different uh, arms of the civilian defense. Um, so this this year we have booklets here that explain what all of those, um, all of these markings, armbands and flags would, meant. Um, and then we, we've got uh, manuals for, for people that were part of the civilian defense program, you know, so that they, they could train themselves to know what to do um, where uh, air raid stations were, how to how to direct people, um, and you know checklists of how to be prepared, how to get your family prepared, um, where's the safest place to go in a building, um, all that kind of stuff that we have in the in the collection. Um, so that's all really interesting stuff, and another way that you could be involved. Um, and I. Don't have anything on those numbers now, but I think that's something that I mentioned in the paper recently, the, the numbers of, of how many people were um, locally were involved in the civilian defense um, efforts. And then they always wanted to um, make sure that they were thinking of the men over there and men and women over there. And that's, that's another thing that you see change. Um, daily, you would see notes from men in service and then later it changes to men and women in service. Um, as as um, we have women involved as wasps, as waves, as you know, help, helping support the effort and going overseas and um, doing what they could as well. So you'll see notes on them. But this is all um, reminding people how to send, how to reach the uh, people overseas, what the last dates for mailing are. Um, so like if you want to get stuff out for Christmas, you know, you're starting in um, in September, and then they'll give you your last date here. And lots of uh, ideas for um, items to send and um, features on the post office, people working at the post office because they were being, they were part of that effort heroes, you know, making sure everything made it to people. Um, and around Valentine's Day, you see great features about people sending um, cards to their sweethearts. And this woman down here, uh, Mrs. Ross was reading through all of those uh, daily uh, notes on servicemen and women and where they're serving and using that to send Bibles to every single person in Clark County that she would see listed. Um, so that she, that was part of her effort to send um, them little uh, miniature Bibles. And we have, I, uh, meant to, I meant to put one of those clippings in there, but, um, those clippings of, of service men and women showing um, where they're serving, where they're training, if they're injured, um, where they're, you know, where they're stationed, who they're with. Um, those are, those run almost daily. And uh, I imagine throughout the war, there was someone who was clipping those because we have a huge, enormous collection of those clippings that are all on cards. And um, a number of years ago, we had uh, volunteers go through and make an index of those. So now you can look up all of the names that come up in the World War II clippings. And then um, we also have ones that were photocopied and in folders. And I think Virginia is on this call. Um, she was part of helping make those available, um, writing out all the names that were there and creating an index so that we can find those, those mentions again. So if, 
you know someone who served in World War II and you want to look up any mention of them, um, you can look through those records and see any time that they were mentioned in the newspaper. Um, and usually includes a picture of them too. So those are a really great resource. Um, other other uh, ways to support were uh, the men in service was to work at the canteen um, that they at the the train depot. Um, so this shows um, the New York Central Canteen. They had just gotten a new cart um, to hold all their goodies. Um, and this is one thing that I really wish we had an actual picture of this. I've only ever run across it in the newspaper, but this is something that we don't have in our um, in the archives. I would love to see a, a picture of um, the canteen or canteen workers or anything to do with the, the depot there, but we don't really have any of that in our own collection. Might be out there, but um, Wittenberg uh, supported the efforts. They had uh, the air, air training program there, as I mentioned, and this is um, when they announced that uh, Myers Hall and Ferncliff were gonna be given over um, to be used by um, trainees there. And I know uh, Jonathan Winters was part of that program uh, at, at Wittenberg during, during the war. And this is showing uh, at the end of that month, the um, co-eds moving out of that uh, Ferncliff Hall and uh, moving elsewhere so that they could give that space up. It's another thing I run across that was interesting because you know later um, the, the, to support uh, men going uh, and women going back to school was the um, uh, uh, GI Bill, but uh, this was a drive in 1943. Uh, students at Wittenberg were doing a soldier student insurance fund to help um, help them return uh, to Wittenberg when they when they came back. So they had started this fund. Uh, and it ran across this one, I thought that was really interesting. And then this is one um, I continued up through the end of 1945 to see some of the after um, the war coverage. And this shows um, uh, servicemen at um, Wittenberg. And this is- That's my dad. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say, your dad is right there, right? <laughs> I, was trying to, I was trying to move the- my screen so I could read the caption because I knew I'd seen him in there. But yeah, your dad, he did he come to Wittenberg specifically to be a part of the war? Uh, was it after the war um, with GI or was he having to do with the, um, the Air Force? Or the Air Force? In, in, during, he came in 1943 <clears throat> and his first job was to manage the dining halls for the GIs that were stationed there. And then after, I mean, he was helping with registration in, after the war for a while. And his job just evolved over the years to where he was vice president and treasurer of Wittenberg. Well, Barbara, I'll have to, I'll have to send this one to you. I, when I ran across it, I said, oh, there he is. <laughs> uh, other things that you see after the war, this was this was earlier in 1942. You see people, they're encouraging, you know, you see a, the, the bus lines are being used because uh, of um, tire rationing and gas rationing. They want people to use the, the buses rather than their own cars. Um, and then this is here in September, 1945, showing, you know, the, the wartime restrictions on, on travel and um, going further afield on buses has been lifted. So people um, encouraging people to travel uh, again. And this here was, uh, was from um, September 1945, showing the first cargo of rubber that was for civilian use again um, coming in. Oh, and that's all I have. <laughs> so there's, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff um, in, in, in our collections. Um, and, uh, I mean, other stories, obviously, we can tell that we tell in other parts of the museum are, uh, with the uh, the actual overseas war efforts that you know the war front, um, and that those you can see on our second floor in our military gallery, you can see the stories of um, you know Bill and Helen Teeman. Um, uh, a couple later, uh, they they volunteered with us, but you know there you can see their their uniforms and their Bill was in the army and Helen was um, was a wave in the Navy, and we've got. Um, Colonel Haynes up there and, and other people who um, and uh, 
Jim Walsh and, and other people with stories you can find in the museum. And then we also have um, lots of uniforms in, in our collection that represent the, the World War II period and, and, and service there. Um, so there's more programs we can do in the future to talk about that. But specifically, I wanted the, the, this one to focus on the, um, the home front. But since this year, we are um, 80 years since uh, America's entry into um, World War II. So we're, we'll probably be doing uh, other programming like this in the future to highlight other, um, other parts of the war. Hey, Dadley, I had so a, you guys uh, uh, Dick Graber here. I had a couple of things to uh, add on to this. I, when I was working at the post office back in the 19, late 1960s and the 70s, we had kind of a joke going around over there. He said, if you wanted to send mail to the service man, send it to Sam or to Bob. Now, Sam was service overseas, service overseas mail, and Bob was military overseas mail. Another thing was that uh, Jonathan Winters probably was about 18 years old in about 1943, because I remember that he was born on Veterans Day in 1925, and so he probably was uh, doing some work maybe for them at uh, his senior year in high school or, or maybe uh, sometime around then in the summertime. That's what I have to add. Well, another another person that I meant to mention um, who was a friend of um, Jonathan Winters was Howdy Weber. And um, just, and I forgot to take a picture of this one. I forgot to include it. I, I can't, I'm, I, I've taken so many pictures of the paper, um, but I, I ran across one where um, Howdy Weber had been missing. And um, it was the announcement that he had been missing for, for a couple of months at that point. Um, and that was something that I, I had not ever seen about him. Um, and he was the photographer for the paper, but he was a good friend of, of Jonathan Winters and, they, and he had served in the Air Corps as well. Um, so, um, yeah, Howdy Weber and... Uh... And, uh, and he worked together quite a bit in taking pictures for the news and Sun. I remember one time uh, uh, they came home to my uh, home to, uh, when I had my weather station there and took some pictures of me because the newspaper was doing a lot of uh, quoting from me at that time. And uh, so I, I knew both of them at that time too. Uh well, yeah, they were they were both interesting characters for sure. Um, and I, I if, if anyone else has any stories or memories or things that they've heard from um, from other people about their their war experiences, um, I, I would love to hear it or, or or you know share it at another time. Um, uh, but it's been really interesting for me to to see uh, this from to to look at it from ex exactly what was happening here in our town to go through and recognize all these names and and know the places where the the rallies are being held or the drives are being held and everything. So it's all uh, really great to see. And um, I just wanted to point out in in the chat, um, Casey has shared links to our um, our Facebook page where you can um, see more of our our posts and things that we've been working on. Um, we've shared a couple of puzzles this week about having to do with uh, the war efforts, and there's a link there where you can um, donate to us um, if, if you would like to do that. But we're also happy to take uh, physical donations of items having to do with your life, or especially um, World War II. I know Patty had given us some wonderful cards um, that her parents, uh, had, her, had, her dad had sent uh, during World War II, um, and uh, we, we love to have great stuff like that. And Sailor has shared a, uh, our, our link to our Instagram where you can where you can see more of the stuff that we've posted. Uh, Sailor has been working with us to help us um, do more on social media and get stuff out there. So um, I, I I I got to do a lot of the fun part here, doing the research for for this particular program, going through the newspapers, which is my favorite thing to do. But um, we still have a lot of newspapers sitting out. Um, so I told her, you know, she she can um, start going through newspapers too because I'm I'm kind of feel like I'm stealing the most fun thing that we have to do in our archives is to go through old newspapers. And I'm I'm gonna go out on a limb here because I'm not I'm not involved in the research for any of these. But you know, if if folks were willing to suggest a topic that we could potentially research in the newspaper for a future program, 
Um, you know, we're definitely, we're always open to input for, you know, things you guys would like to hear about at these evening programs. So. And this, this program was, uh, was a suggestion of uh, Bill McGregor um, that we, that we do something about World War II. And I said, well, I've been, I've been saving home front stuff already. I can keep doing that. <laughs> so <laughs> that's when I started really um, doubling down on my newspaper research. So that's a lot of fun to do. Uh, and we're always happy to have other people come in and look through stuff. Um, stuff. Um, unfortunately, all of our local papers are not online, um, like some areas have. So we still we still have great microfilm and, and originals. So we, we do have resources, but I kind of wish sometimes that I could just search for my house. But um, our, our papers are not all part of the, the, the ones online yet. Does anyone have anything else that they want to share or ask or, or say? Uh, our next program, what day, where, where are we now? At the end of this month, uh, at the end of March on the, uh, the 26th, we'll be on um, Clark County baseball. Uh, so this will be a, a chance to look at uh, people from Clark County who uh, played in the majors. Uh, we'll look at uh, local teams that were part of the, um, you know, from the different factories and, and businesses that, that, um, those club teams will will look at women who played with the um, national, uh, whatever they call the the baseball league, the league of their own ladies that that played during uh, World War II. That was something that I uh, admittedly, as I was going through my newspaper research, I was mostly skipping over the sports um, features, but um, that's a whole other program that we can do. So I'll try and cover some of that. Um, the you know baseball during the war years when we do the baseball program, but we'll look at Harvey Haddix and Brooks Lawrence and all the other locals that, um, that want, want, went on to play in the majors um, at that program. Hey, Danley, I have another thing to add on that. While I was working at the post office, somebody came up with the idea of, of having me manage a, a team that worked with the post office that was a softball team after my weather station, Dick's Weather Service back in 1984. And we actually won a championship for the league that we had back then. That oh, wow. Like, well, I yeah. say, Dick, if you, if you have anything about the team, I'd love yeah. to include them in the presentation. I'll have to get yeah, with you well, if, you have, any, that, if you have any pictures trophy, or anything. I lost trophy. <laughs> well, I'll take a picture of your trophy. <laughs> well, well I'll, I'll get with you. We'll, we'll try and make sure we can include that in the presentation. <laughs> well, okay. Um, I don't have the trophy, but I'll, I'll, I certainly want to talk with you about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we'll 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 get what we can in there. Um, I think I Dick. I think you've attended it, um, a number of. I was going to say, I think Dick's attended every single one of these um, since we started. So you know, if we can work something of his into the presentation, that would be. <laughs> yeah. well, I say, uh, I think uh, May marks a year that we've been doing these. So I'm I'm glad you guys are still still coming to the virtual programs. Always happy to take um, ideas for new ones. Um, but we are actually kind of booked up through July. We've got ideas. Um, the mall is closing in June. So that kind of helped us um, decide our June program we're going to do um, on June 16th will be a look back at Upper Valley Mall. So we hope people will come and um, share their memories of the mall um, then. And then um, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head right now, the other June program. But in July, we're going to be looking at um, the Clark County Fair and its history and share lots of fair photos. Um, and I think, I think the other part of July is still open. So if anybody has ideas um, for programs, we're happy to take them. But Patty, you yeah. might, I don't, I don't know exactly what Natalie's got planned, but you know, I don't know if uh, uh, pictures of the artifacts her friend has from the Upper Valley Mall would be of interest for the program or um, if we should get pictures of those or. Yeah, Patty, if you have mall stuff. He worked at Richmond Brothers, and when they closed the store down, they put all the stuff in the dumpster, and he asked the manager, so he's got the shield with Richmond Brothers on it and a tablecloth with the name, and he just, he says it's in his upstairs, and I just need to put the impetus to look a little faster, but yeah. he's definitely willing to donate and uh, get things in, so... That's great. And I mean, and when the, when the mall closes, we'll see what kind of, what kind of stuff um, we're able to get out of there to document the, the, the history of the mall. I know they've got some good blueprints and maps and things like that there. So we're working with them to um, 
help make sure we we get some of that stuff so that we can we can save that history for people. Yeah. Thank you, you guys for coming tonight. And yeah. I hope that I haven't been breaking in and out. I keep getting messages that my internet is unstable. So I apologize if I have been. Uh, but you know, thank you guys, and hopefully we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Good job, Natalie. Thank you, Natalie. Let's have a good night. Bye.